In March 2013, a man walking his dog on the outskirts of Peterborough in Cambridgeshire made a shocking and grisly discovery. Dumped in a rural ditch was the body of a man who'd been violently stabbed to death. The police didn't know it yet, but there was a serial killer on the loose. When is the next body going to turn up? We've got to find it who did this, and we've got to find it quickly. The investigation would lead detectives to a woman, a violent individual who'd killed without hesitation or remorse, and for no other reason than the pleasure and gratification it offered her. She is heartless, ruthless, and sadistic. During a 12-day killing spree, Joanne Dennehy butchered three men and left a trail of destruction that stretched from east to west across the UK. She's not somebody who feels bad, who feels remorseful, who regrets things. She does what she wants to do, and she doesn't care about the consequences. Joanne Dennehy had ruthlessly become one of the world's most evil killers. In April 2013, police in Hereford arrested a runaway fugitive and her besotted accomplice. In a killing spree that lasted almost two weeks, 31-year-old Joanne Dennehy had murdered three men and stabbed two others in broad daylight, leaving them for dead. One of the most dangerous women in criminal history, she's now locked away in prison and will remain there for the rest of her life. The fact that she'll never see daylight again in the outside world is of huge comfort for the family. For Joanne Dennehy, it's absolutely the right thing that she won't come out of prison. Joanne Dennehy's crimes were incomprehensible to the British public. At the time of her imprisonment, author and journalist Christopher Berry D took a special interest in the case. I wanted to really try to get inside how the police were working and how rapidly they caught this very dangerous woman. The strong curiosity he had for Dennehy's crimes caught the attention of the murderer herself, and very soon Christopher was in written correspondence with the killer behind bars. Her letters beautifully written, um, very eloquent, very good grammar, um, certainly on a par with you know, somebody of a good education behind them. Um, and we developed this relationship where I was trying to get inside her head but at the same time, she, being the arch manipulator, was trying to get inside my head. His attention peaked, and Christopher eventually went to visit Dennehy at Bronzefield Prison in 2015. She looked into my eyes and she said to me, Christopher, killing you would be good for me. And it was an ice cold stare, I can tell you. So, yes, she would have killed me in a heartbeat if she'd had a chance. The story of this cold-blooded killer begins over 35 years ago in the picturesque city of St Albans in Hertfordshire. Joanne Dennehy was born in 1982 and began life in a loving and secure family home. Very few could have predicted this bright and intelligent young girl would turn into a sadistic monster with a taste for violence. By all accounts, she was starting off in life with a what we might say is a perfect foundational upbringing. Joanne Dennehy appears to come from quite a normal family. She had a relatively uneventful childhood. She's one of, of two siblings. Um, her, her mother worked in a supermarket. Her father worked as a security guard and for a, a telecommunications company. And from the outside, they appear to be a, a normal family. She had a sister to which she was very close. Uh, they had even developed a secret language. Uh, she, was, uh, she played netball for the school. Um, she was a very <laughs> normal, quite bright schoolgirl. But Dennehy's idyllic childhood was curtailed as she entered her teens. She started to experiment with drugs, she started not going to school, and she linked up with a man called John Trina. Her parents, they were at their wits' end. They didn't know what to do. Uh, they tried to keep her locked up or bring her home from school. The teachers tried to reprimand her. And the more they tried to control Joe, it was Joe saying, stuff you. And it, it was li literally like throwing petrol on a fire. Dennehy and Trina ran away together, embarking on a turbulent relationship. 
Despite Dennehy's violent outbursts, the couple had two children together and eventually settled in Cambridgeshire. I think quite a lot is made of the fact that Joanne Dennehy misused alcohol and, and drugs, but, but I think she's well aware of the fact that this is going to be discussed, and she knows that these offer quite a convenient excuse for her behaviour. And alcohol and drugs and other substances can disinhibit, but that's assuming that people have got those moral standards to begin with, and Joanne Dennehy didn't have them in the first place. A very disturbed woman, she had done a lot of self-harm, of cutting herself and so on. So there were a number of danger signs that this was somebody who was not attuned to society. As time went on, Dennehy's erratic behaviour intensified. She'd cheat on Trina and leave him and their two children for sporadic periods of time. Her drinking worsened and she reportedly began to carry a knife hidden in her boot. I think she's, she's somebody who perhaps has always enjoyed hurting other people. It's almost like she's this crazy scientist and the world is her experiment. Finally, in 2009, Trinor took the children and fled from Dennehy, afraid of what she might do next. The company that she was keeping as well, she was surrounded by people who were similarly disconnected. So, so I think when there was no check or filter or break on her behaviour, she was only going to get worse. Dennehy had become no stranger to the local police. She'd been in and out of prison for drug offences and was also given a 12-month community order for being in control of a dangerous dog. In February 2012, Dennehy spent three days on the psychiatric unit at Peterborough City Hospital, where she was diagnosed with a series of disorders. She has had various diagnoses attached to her, antisocial personality disorder, psychopathic personality disorder. And these are our conditions, they're not mental illnesses. And there's a real important difference between the two because people with personality disorders know the difference between right and wrong. They're, they're fully rational, they're in control of what they're doing, but they choose to do it anyway. So she's not somebody who feels bad, who feels remorseful, who regrets things. She does what she wants to do and she doesn't care about the consequences. By 2013, 31-year-old Dennehy had settled in a small bedsit in Byfield, a housing estate in Peterborough. But the local residents were unaware of her troubled past or her violent nature. One of Dennehy's new neighbours was Michelle Bowles. She was polite to me. Like, but I wouldn't melt, melt on her mouth, basically. She was well-spoken to me and never swore. She was actually quite pleasant, do you know what I mean? I showed her respect. She loved babies. She was excellent with children. Um, I didn't have a problem with her. When I saw her or spoke to her, I said hello. She said hello back. But other residents were not so sure. Michelle's friend, John Chapman, lived in the same building as Dennehy. He was a Falklands War veteran who'd fallen on hard times. I don't know what regiment he used to be in. I should know, because the man of stories used to say. It's just John being smiley all the time and happy and like, nice to know. But John Chapman didn't smile when Joanne Dennehy was around. John was petrified. John came in mine and he said, on several occasions, there's this mad woman moved in. She says she's going to get rid of me whatever way she can. And he was right to be afraid. In just a few months, Joanne Dennehy's threats would turn to violence and John Chapman would be dead. In early 2013, Joanne Dennehy was living in sheltered housing in Peterborough following the breakup of her relationship. Her ex-partner had left her after becoming increasingly concerned about her erratic and sadistic behaviour. The bedsit that Dennehy now called home was managed by Kevin Lee, a father of two who lived in Peterborough with his wife, Christina. She remembers hearing about this strange new tenant. Christina has asked for her identity to be concealed. He was stressed with work, the money element of it, it was turning into kind of a nightmare, really. It was getting a little bit unmanageable. Kevin used to house disadvantaged people. So he'd done it for years, and obviously was used to giving people chances. Um, and so he did with, with 
her. But Kevin Lee and Dennehy's relationship quickly grew into more than just a business one. Lee began to employ Dennehy as a rent collector. Obviously, I wasn't aware at the time. To me, it would have been just another tenant. And he just said about this woman and that she's really tough, really hard. He needed to evict some people. And whether she was threatening and it suited him, because he wasn't getting any joy from the council. So I think she had a bit of wellies and, you know, a really big mouth and threatening. And I don't know whether that, at the time, he thought that was his only way out and to deal with these people. 48-year-old Kevin Lee became infatuated with the younger Dennehy, and they soon became lovers. In exchange, Dennehy was living rent-free in at least two of Lee's properties across Peterborough. In a household, that becomes quite apparent if someone's behaviour's sort of changed and didn't seem quite himself. Dennehy would make up unnerving stories to impress her new landlord and lover. At so one point, she told Kevin Lee her father had abused her and that she'd killed him. Absolute nonsense, of course, never did anything of the kind. She was neither abused nor did he, was he dead, but she was also a pathological liar. Kevin just said about her that um, she spent eight years in prison because he raped her as a child, abused her as a child. Um, it's not an unbelievable story, but then when Kevin said that she'd also killed other people and that she hadn't got caught for those, it sounded a bit far-fetched. I just I didn't know what to think. I didn't know whether it was a truth or whether it was just a load of old rubbish. But it wasn't long before Joanne Dennehy turned her murderous fantasies into reality. 31-year-old Lukas Slabozewski had moved to the UK from Poland in 2005. After meeting Dennehy a few days previously, he began exchanging text messages with her. On the 19th of March 2013, Slabozewski went to visit Dennehy at one of the houses she was staying in on Rolleston Garth and was never seen alive again. She almost certainly lured this man with the promise of some kind of sexual favour. But without a moment's hesitation, she stabbed him through the chest once, very, very hard, killing him almost instantly. Slabozewski had been coaxed into Dennehy's deadly embrace. She led him to believe the pair were in a relationship. He willingly and naively entered the trap she'd laid for him. Everybody that comes into contact with Joanne Dennehy, it's like falling into a spider's web. And you can't get out. Men can't get out. They become entranced by her for all sorts of reasons. Dennehy had complete disregard for the life she'd just taken. Dennehy puts this poor Polish man's body in a wheelie bin and then shows it to a 14-year-old. And so, look how, how clever I am. I've killed this man in the wheelie bin. But it was only a temporary solution. Dennehy knew she couldn't keep Slabozewski's body in a bin. She had to dispose of it quickly, but she needed help. She called upon one of her friends, 47-year-old Gary Stretch, who was more than willing to assist. Joanne Dennehy is quite bright. She's quite clever. So she's able to exert quite a lot of control in her interactions with, with other people. And that's what makes her exceptionally dangerous. Now, looking at the relationship that Joanne Dennehy had with her accomplices, I think she was able to, to charm these men. She was able to kind of lure them in, really, and they would have been flattered by her attentions. You know, here she is, this younger woman wanting to spend time with them. These were men who had quite dull, quite boring lives, and I think they were quite excited to, to get involved in, in what Joanne wanted to do. At seven foot two inches tall, Gary Stretch towered above Dennehy's slight frame. An unsuccessful burglar, Stretch was absolutely infatuated by her twisted and lethal charms. Gary Stretch and Joanne Dennehy met uh, when both of them were on parole from prison for various offences. She realised that she could use him to do whatever she wanted. Um, he was her bodyguard, her minder. Um, and that's how they formed this team, which became so overpowering for Stretch that he would do anything for her. I don't think Joanne Danny had any emotional feelings towards her accomplices whatsoever. They were useful to her at the time and, 
and she just cast them aside when she was finished with them. With the help of Stretch, Dennehy dumped Luka Slabazewski's body in a ditch in rural Thorny Dyke, just 10 miles east of Peterborough city centre. Unable to control herself, her confidence rising and her desire for violence building, in just over a week, Dennehy would strike once more. She turned her attention towards her fellow Byfield resident, 56-year-old Falklands War veteran John Chapman, who reportedly had walked in on Dennehy while she was in the shared bathroom of their bedsit. Every time he spoke about her, he was with fear, like this, in his tone of voice. And we thought, it's just John, J John, just leave it. If she starts, here's our phone numbers, ring us, and we'd come around, just, you know, help you and get you in here with us. He went, thanks. And that was the last time we saw John. On March the 29th, 2013, Dennehy attacked the helpless John Chapman. John Chapman was an inoffensive, kindly man who may have been asleep or in an alcoholic stupor when Dennehy killed him. But she did so by stabbing him once in the neck, severing his carotid artery, and then five times in the chest with such force that one wound broke the breastbone. Um, it also punctured his heart. It's a frenzy that is quite difficult to comprehend, but evidence of what the behavioural scientists now call escalation. First victim, one stab wound. Second victim, six stab wounds. It's heartbreaking. See a poor defenceless man killed. And to know what she'd done to him, how she killed him, it was just heartbreaking for us all. Dennehy was developing her confidence and her crimes were becoming more and more brutal with each move. Now, where Joanne Dennehy is so bad is that this woman actually used a knife to attack a grown, strong man is very up close and personal. It's not at a point of a gun, which is not quite such a personal thing. It's not by bludgeoning. It's not by strangulation. By nature, a woman is not often strong enough to strangle a strong man. But this is a young woman using a knife to repeatedly stab somebody. And for that reason alone, makes her a hands-on, blood-lusting killer. I can't describe how evil this woman is. I really can't. She's the worst I've ever met. It's always been said the woman's method of killing is usually poisoning. It can sometimes be other things, but knives, no. It's a very male killing method. And it's led some people to speculate that Dennehy was to some extent trying to be more male, more masculine, than the men around her, because she felt they were rather f weak and feeble, and she had to be the boss, and being a boss meant you were male. But Dennehy was offsetting one rule with another, that of a femme fatale, charming and enticing men into her life, before switching character in an instant with deadly results. We're quite quick to, to point to Joanne Dennehy's masculine traits, because they're the ones that, that are most visible to us her aggression and her violence and the very brutal way in which she perpetrated these murders. But I don't think she's somebody who would be like that all the time, because that wouldn't serve her needs all of the time. I think sometimes she was feminine and she was demure. In a way, she, she's somebody who will just adapt her, her behavior. Um, so it's, it's very difficult to know who the real Joanne Dennehy is. After killing John Chapman, Dennehy didn't hesitate in continuing her rampage. On the very same day, she'd strike again with fatal consequences. Later that day, she lures her boss and her lover and the bed-sitting house's owner, Kevin Lee, to the house. But this time, Dennehy wasn't in the mood for love. She was searching for another victim to try and quench her murderous desires. March the 29th would be the last time that Kevin Lee was seen alive. Joanne Dennehy was in the middle of a murderous rampage. Having taken the life of 31-year-old Polish man Lukasz Slabazewski 10 days earlier, Dennehy had just killed 56-year-old John Chapman 
and had a third victim in her sights, a landlord, Kevin Lee. The pair had been having a secret affair. Kevin's wife, Christina, was the first to notice something was awry when he didn't arrive home on that March evening. He was very much like a come home from work, tea on the table, pyjamas on. He was quite sort of traditional and old-fashioned in that sense. I tried to ring him and his phone wasn't on, which was odd in itself. He'd never have his phone switched off because it's, that's, that was his livelihood, that was his business. And I knew it had charge. Kevin had felt threatened by Dennehy days before, but he'd wrongly assumed it was just bravado. Kevin did tell me that she told him that she wanted to kill again. And I think that was the crucial thing because it wasn't just a case of bragging or mentioning that she'd committed murders in the past. It was the fact that she specifically told him she wanted to kill again. So that's going to unnerve anybody, false or not. It's just not a thing that normal people say. Hours passed. Growing desperately concerned, Christina, with the help of Kevin's business partner, Paul Creed, tried to trace Kevin. I asked Paul to look at Kevin's phone records, so he gave them to me, and there was a number that kept appearing on the telephone, and I said to Paul, I said, um, which houses are empty at the moment because they need work doing to them? And he gave me a list, and I subsequently just went round to each of those properties. I knew he was in trouble it that way at that point. I knew there was something not right. I knew Kevin wasn't coming home. Christina began an urgent hunt, unaware her search was in vain. Dennehy had already struck. She'd stabbed Kevin Lee to death at the same house in Rolleston Garth where she'd murdered Lukas Slabozewski ten days earlier. Lee was Dennehy's third victim. I wouldn't describe Joanne Dennehy as a serial killer. I would describe her as a spree killer because there didn't seem to be any points during her, her killing spree in which she returned to any semblance of, of what was a normal life for her. It tended to be a, a continuous chain of events. What is not in doubt is that these first three victims were simply a prelude to what she hoped would be a further spree. Dennehy, again with the help of Gary Stretch, and this time another accomplice, Leslie Layton, deposited the bodies of John Chapman and Kevin Lee on the outskirts of town. Chapman was placed at Thorny Dyke, the same spot where they dumped Lukas Slabozewski's body ten days previously. Kevin Lee was left ten miles further north at nearby Newborough. Dennehy dressed Lee's body in women's clothing and left him positioned in a grotesque and crude manner with his buttocks exposed. I think Joanna Dennehy was unusual in that she liked humiliating her victims. There was clearly uh, a modus operandi there, and there was a clearly a motive, the pleasure of, of killing somebody rather than doing it for some particular reason. Oblivious to the fate of her husband, Christina Lee was becoming increasingly concerned about Kevin's whereabouts. I rang the police, then I went back with Paul Creed to one specific house because I noticed that the light wasn't on and then it was on when we went back later. So I thought, there's obviously somebody at the house and I just said to the police, you know, I'm really worried, expressed my concerns and gave them permission to break into the house, which they did. Inside the house on Rolleston Garth, there were no obvious signs of trouble, but the police immediately sensed that something was wrong. They said that they could smell... There was a really strong smell of bleach, and they could see some blood on the floor, and, you know, I just knew. And Christina wouldn't have to wait long for news of her husband. The following day, March the 30th, 2013, Police were called to an area of farmland in Newborough by a dog walker who'd made an horrific discovery. You know, you see it on TV all the time, the dreaded knock at the door. Um, and then two detectives came. And obviously he had not been identified at that point, but they just said that they'd found a body, which 
you know, I was expecting to hear that. So they just kind of told me what I was expecting to hear. You don't feel anything, cos you... cos you know. And it's a feeling that you've never felt before. So, you know, where some people might think you'll be doing this, you'll be doing that. I don't know, it's just kind of a blur, really. You're just alive, I think that's... But not alive, you're just existing. For police, a very serious picture was beginning to emerge of a killer on the run with an unstoppable determination for destruction. When is the next body going to turn up? We've got to find it who did this, and we've got to find them quickly. Detectives soon discovered Kevin Lee's burnt-out car. Christina had provided them with Dennehy's phone number, and by using it, they were able to form a crucial link. They must have been trying to call it to, and using their systems or whatever, must have tracked it down through GPS that the location of Kevin's burnt-out car was where this mobile had been. So it was quite obvious that she'd been there. They realised that he knows somebody called Joanne Dennehy, and there was an affair between them. And then they came across a man called Leslie Layton, who they interviewed. He tried to cover up. He didn't know anything about them, where they were, which, in fact, he did. He soon cracked because he was weak-willed, spineless. And he said, yes, Dennehy and Stretch are on the run. They've gone east and they'll probably come west. And with that, the police went wallop. They, they issued a national wanted alert for every agency in the country to find these, this couple as quickly as possible. Dennehy and Stretch were now wanted fugitives. She reveled in the idea, high on the thrill of being on the run. She loved the notoriety of it. Um, she relished the fact that the men around her were frightened of her. In an attempt to try and evade the authorities, Dennehy and Stretch first headed to Norfolk, where they burgled a house. They then made their way across country to Hereford with the intention of selling the stolen goods to help fund their escape. Dennehy and Stretch became a, a sort of a, I hate to say this, a Bonnie and Clyde type outfit. Their faces were in all the newspapers now. They were wanted, most wanted. After they burgled another property in Hertfordshire, the pair stopped 20 miles outside of Hereford to liaise with a man named Mark Lloyd, who joined Dennehy and Stretch on the journey. They get an accomplice or a friend of theirs to bring the stolen property into Hereford town to sell it, and it's at that point that Dennehy decides she wants to kill again. It had been four days since the murders of John Chapman and Kevin Lee. On April the 2nd, 2013, with Mark Lloyd in tow, Dennehy was caught on CCTV entering this small shop in Hereford at 3.30 p.m. She's seen pointing at the cashier in a threatening manner. Just 10 minutes after this footage was captured, Dennehy, in an unprovoked random attack, attempted to murder a fourth man. She had this terrific anger and bloodlust. She's had a quarter bottle of whiskey. She's been smoking roll-ups. And she suddenly sees a man walking his dog in broad daylight. And she says to Stretch, stop, we stopped the car, I want to kill him. Brandishing a knife, Dennehy jumps out of the car and runs up behind him and stabs him in the back. Dennehy's unfortunate victim was Robin Baressa, a 63-year-old retired fireman. You knew exactly how she, what she intended to do. I'm going to kill you, she said to the fireman. I want to hurt you, I'm going to kill you. And she plunges this five-inch lock knife into his back time and time and time again. The man thought he'd been punched. He turned around and saw her covered in his blood. He collapsed. She calmly walked away and got in the car and said to Stretch, no, let's go and find somebody else. Back in the car, Dennehy took the time to pose for this selfie. It seemed unbelievable to imagine, but she wasn't finished. Having felt the thrill of attack once, she hunted out her second victim of the day. Ten minutes after the first attack, she spots another man walking his dog, and it was the same bloodthirsty scenario all over again. She got out and she told Stretch to stop the car. She got out with this very small knife, uh, walked up to him and plunged it into him time and time and time and time again. 
Can you imagine the shock? This man wouldn't have known what was happening. It's broad daylight. She's licking the blood off of the knife, his blood. He, he feels himself getting dizzy and sick. And then he collapses. And she takes this dog, walks casually back to the, the car. Another car passes, and she waves at the people in it. They get in the car, and off they go. This second helpless victim was John Rogers, a 56-year-old Hereford local. Dennehy stabbed him more than 30 times. It was an horrific and entirely spontaneous act, completely lacking in reason. It is a reflection of a brutality, a viciousness, a lack of any kind of control that makes Dennehy very unusual. She is a most frightening figure who uh, behaves in the most obscenely violent way imaginable, almost defying belief. When we look at the, the two attempted murders, you know, towards the end of her, her spree, this is something altogether different. These are strangers, these are men that, that she doesn't know. So I think what was happening here was that she was up in the ante, she was getting bored. You find that psychopaths tend to have a proneness to boredom and a need for stimulation, so, so she was even applying that to her murders. Remarkably, both men survived these attacks. Although their injuries were life-threatening, they were still able to give the police descriptions of Dennehy and the instantly recognisable star tattoo on her cheek. By now, the police sirens are going all round, and blue lights are going all round Hebridgeshire. They're panicking. It's like somebody's kicked over a wasp nest. The local police had been alerted to her spree and were about to put an end to her bloodshed. They cornered Dennehy and Stretch on Newton Close in Hereford. Two officers turn up and they spot this car with Dennehy in it, talking to the dog on the back seat, while Gary Stretch is trying to negotiate stolen property at the front door of one of his associates' house. They arrest Dennehy on the spot. Gary Stretch and one of his friends do what they call in police parlance a runner. They jump in another car and speed off. Something like a car chase goes on for about 20 miles, and then Stretch decides to get out and run for it. Now, Mr Stretch is not built for speed, and of course he's very unfit and he's stopped, and he turned around to the police officer and said, ah, you've arrested me, Joe and I would have been the next Bonnie and Clyde. Footage of Dennehy in custody at Hannyford Police Station just 40 minutes after stabbing two men and leaving them for dead showed her laughing and joking with the arresting officers. One more for attempted murder and murder. Attempted murder and murder, what's that mean? It's like going down for Sunday roads. Joanne Dennehy is like a chameleon. Um, she's become a very accomplished actor, so she will play to whatever audience is in front of her. Um, she can be charming and, and sound very educated and, and literate. And at the same time, to another audience, she could sound quite rough and quite downbeat. So she's, she's really honed these, these skills of responding to, to the people that, that are around her. The following day, April the 3rd, 2013, the bodies of Dennehy's other two victims were discovered just outside of Peterborough. In a ditch on farmland at Thorny Dyke, investigators found 31-year-old Luka Slabazewski and 56-year-old John Chapman, a close friend of Michelle Bowles. We wasn't concerned till we actually noticed he was missing. No one had seen him at all. The next thing we knew, the forensics were around the back of the house. We were praying outside, thinking, please don't let it be John, let him live. If we had known what he meant and what she was going to do at the time, we would have got John out of that house and let him live with us. But how were we supposed to know she was a serial killer? To take John's life, Lucas's life and Kevin's life, why? Joanne Dennehy's pre-trial hearing was set for the 18th of November. It's very difficult to understand quite how far the road is from a nice suburban upbringing to a ditch in Peterborough where you're dumping the bodies of men you've stabbed to death. It's an extraordinarily long road.
a very dangerous one and a very destructive one, but she certainly travelled it and took some pleasure in the travelling. At the hearing of the Old Bailey, Dennehy was devoid of remorse. She laughed as proceedings took place and stunned her legal team when she chose to plead guilty. The fact that Joanna Dennehy decided to admit murdering these three men and denying them a lawful burial took the whole of court to by surprise, including her defence barrister, who said that proceedings weren't going as anticipated. So the judge asked Joanna Dennehy in the dock what she'd said. She told him, I have pleaded guilty, and that's that. Karim Khalil, defending Gary Stretch, remembers the shock that rippled through the courtroom when this unexpected plea was heard. It surprised all, I think, but the judge, who seemed entirely satisfied with that result. Um, her counsel asked for time to speak with her to see whether she really had meant what she just said and returned to tell the court that, yes, she entirely understood the charges against her. She meant to plead guilty and that was the end of it. Many of the serial killers I've interviewed obviously is guilty of sin, try to hide behind the criminal justice system and use it as uh, a defence uh, to retreat back into it, uh, to use mitigation. Uh, um, I, I didn't intend to kill somebody. But I had a drink disorder or a drug disorder. Or I'm not culpable of committing these crimes. Basically, I'm innocent. Joanne Dennehy is not like that. She just loved it. Kevin Lee's widow, Christina, couldn't bring herself to face the woman who dragged her husband down into her own sordid world and destroyed her family. I went to court, but I stayed in the family room. I didn't want to be in there because I didn't want that thing to ever see my face. I thought, you haven't got the luxury to grace my face, so therefore you shall not see me. She was that cocky and pathetic and so predictable. And I just thought it's just so abhorrent that I thought, no, it's just best off in another room. During the hearing, Dennehy's partner in crime, Gary Stretch, argued he was manipulated by her throughout the killing spree. Gary Stretch's position was that he had not known that she was going to kill any of the people that she killed, um, whilst accepting that after the event, um, he was made aware that she had killed people. And the difficulty, of course, that he confronted um, was the assertion that he was a willing participant in covering up those killings once he became aware of them. There's no question in my mind um, that uh, Dennehy uh, did influence uh, Gary Stretch hugely. Joanne Dennehy is somebody who was very much in the driving seat all the way through the, the murders that, that she committed, and the men were just there in, in a supporting role. You know, she was, she was the, the centre stage actor here, and I think the fact that she was doing this on her own, she wasn't coerced or compelled by, by anybody else, does make her quite unique. In a final act of defiance, Dennehy refused to relinquish control of her fate over to the legal system. She stood up in court and told the judge exactly how she felt. I don't want to be controlled by anybody. I don't want to be in control by my lawyers, by the police, by anybody. And that's what she told the judge. Get stuffed, basically. Get stuffed, Your Honour. On February the 28th, 2014, Mr Justice Spencer sentenced Joanne Dennehy to a whole life term. She became the first woman in British history to directly receive this highest of custodial sentences in a courtroom. Dennehy was immediately sent to Bronzefield Prison. She will never be released. Dennehy's accomplices were also imprisoned for their part in her crimes. Leslie Layton, who helped dispose of two of the bodies, received 14 years. And Gary Stretch received two life sentences. It was a bittersweet relief for Michelle Bowles. It's a victim's family as well, they're carrying the life sentences, isn't they? Carefully, he's not going to see his kids like, have kids. Lucas is never ever going to have kids. John, you know, he's never going to be around again. None of them are. He wasn't a horrible person. He was one of the loveliest, generous people you could ever meet. He really was. He would have done anything for anybody. It'll take years for Christina Lee and her family to get back to normal after Dennehy callously ended the life of her husband. Personally, it makes you want to 
rethink the death penalty. To me, that'd be too easy for somebody like that. Let them rot wherever they are, really. So, yeah, I expected that. I think it was just so hideous how a female, you know, it's hard to even think that's a woman. Would I say she got what she deserved? Not at all. She didn't get what she deserved. She just is where she needs to be. It's just everything, everything has changed. You know, what was a family unit and people just going about their business, everything came crashing down. He was a laugh a second. He was the most, one of the most optimistic persons I've ever come across. Never moaned about anything, not negative about anything. Any problem would be overcome. We laughed a lot. So, yeah, we had a lot of fun. Joanne Dennehy has refused to disappear quietly. Even in prison, she's continued to wreak havoc. From the day Joanna Dennehy was sentenced to prison, she has exhibited more antisocial behavioural traits in as much as she's tried to escape twice. She wanted to chop the fingers off a, a prison officer and use that on the electronic keypads to get out. Dennehy's absolute lack of remorse and the savagery involved in her crimes are beyond the public's understanding of what a woman would usually be capable of. Joanne Dennehy was unusual in that the most notorious women murderers in this country have tended to be associated with a man, either Myra Hindley associated with Ian Brady or Rose West associated with her husband Fred Dennehy was kind of acting alone, although she had people helping her a bit afterwards, covering things up, but she was a kind of self-motivated murderer. I think the, the reason that we're so fascinated and so shocked by female serial killers is because of our general expectations of the role of women in society. We expect them to be the carers and the nurturers and the givers rather than the takers of life. Dennehy touched the public imagination because she was a young woman and one who seemed to contradict everything that most of us expect of women. And to do so in such a cavalier and violent way that she set herself apart from the female population. She's in prison now and she's going to be in prison for the rest of her life. But Joanne and he will not stop manipulating. She will manipulate the system. She'll work the system. And when the time's right, she'll definitely kill again. It's difficult to comprehend the insatiable killing spree of Joanne Dennehy. With a lust for blood and a twisted lack of morals, she manipulated others along her way as she murdered three men and brutally attempted to kill two strangers in broad daylight. The safest place for a dangerous individual like Joanne Dennehy is behind bars, which is where she will remain for the rest of her life.